Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your powerful light that has come into the world. Into the midst of darkness, we recognize the light coming from your Son. We pray that you would bless us now as we gather in his name that we would be able to see him present in our midst, to be able to receive him and to carry him into the darkness of the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So two old guys are talking one day. They're enjoying a conversation back and forth and just uh, in telling the stories. And, and the one guy says, you know, I was at a restaurant last week. It was phenomenal. I mean, it was great. The meat was juicy. It was rare like I like it. Uh, um, you know, and it was cheap. It was reasonable. It was great. The other guy says, well, what's the name of the restaurant? I might want to go. He says, um, um. You know, my, my memory's having more trouble. What's, what's the name of that uh, flower? You know, it's red, it's got a bloom on it. Uh, you know, what, what's the name of it? The guy says, Rose. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Hey, Rose, what was the name of the restaurant we... That, that's a mnemonic device. That's what that's officially called, and we're going to get up a little bit level in our educational level. It's some way of remembering something else, whatever it is. Um, I... I still remember some of my Greek from seminary days. I, I really loved Greek. It's very exacting. It's like a spreadsheet. The rules apply all the time. And, uh, but there are a lot of words that are not English, and a lot of them have no connection to English. And so you begin to use mnemonic devices to be able to remember the words. And every year, every year, I have asked you what epiphany means. And every year, I tell you the parts that make up the word. And, and the word is epi. Fano. That almost sounds English, except that epiphany isn't an English word. So, so I remember to this day how I remember what this means. Fano means to shine. But then epi, it's a little preposition, and uh, I used a mnemonic device. I, I won't share it, but I remember to this day that epi means upon. A pee upon. I don't know. I still remember it. It's whatever no device I have to use. Some way to recognize that it's the light shining on us from Jesus. 
It's a matter of light and darkness. And so over the next weeks, we're going to be hearing stories about Jesus that, that really make a difference, that, that enabled people in that day and enable us in our day to really know that Jesus is more and then fill in the blank. He's more than a powerful guy. He's powerful, but we have powerful people in the world. He's more than a smart guy. Oh, we got Stephen Hawking. I mean, we could compare brain cells. Uh, well, he is more than any of those things. He's more than what they called him almost all the time, rabbi, teacher, instructor. You had a professor that was really powerful to you. You still remember him. I've got mine. He's more than that. He is the light of the world. Now, that's an odd description. I mean, we're used to it, but if you think about it, of all the things to call Jesus, why would that have any significance? Other than the fact that there's so much darkness. I mean, you know what darkness is. Darkness is not really something. It's the absence of something. Light. You have darkness wherever there isn't light. And without light, you don't have life. I mean, we, we know that, right? I mean, when the bulb burns out in the sky there, you know, when that thing wears out, uh, we're not here anymore. Uh, we're we're going to be uh, really frozen if I'm cold today. Imagine without the sun. Without the light, there is no life. Plants don't grow. We don't live. Regardless of how you understand history and whether there was a comet and all the, the uh, atmosphere covered with darkness and all the death, and well, you know, there, there, we can't live without that light. And Christ is the light of the world. And the darkness is pervasive. Now, I, I wrote that down, and, and as soon as I said that, I said, I, I'd really like some synonyms for pervasive. Because it's true. It's, it's there. It's right here in this room. If it weren't for the lights, we'd be in darkness, right? So it's pervasive. And I looked them up, and here are some words to see if it gets you where I'm going. Prevalent, permeating, ubiquitous. It is everywhere. It's not like, oh, well, we can go to some universe where there's just light all the time. Uh, there is darkness all the time. Omnipresent, universal. It's describing the impact of sin. That's the darkness. That's what Scripture really does. Talks about light and darkness, light being that of God, and darkness being the absence of God. It is where sin is. We don't have his rules applying. We don't listen to his word. We design our own. And, and although that may be helpful for growing tomatoes or for uh, speeding down the road or fixing your car, all of those things are absent God until he comes and shines light on it. The darkness is seen. I looked it up. I did a Google search. I said, how many wars are going on in the world right now? And one of the problems is you've got to decide what a war is. You know, is there a certain number of people having died? That's how they actually determine it. Their evaluation of a war is uh, the four wars that are going on in the world right now where this last year more than 10,000 people died. That sounds like war to me. Uh, and, and then they break it down. Uh, there are, uh, let me see, uh, 13 uh, where between 1,000 and 9,999 people died. And then there's 23 that are less than 1,000. But in some ways, that's not really the truth. I mean, we've got, give or take a couple, 7.6 billion people in the world. And, and wars are popping up all the time in every one of us. I mean, all, all, all we guys have to do is to walk in after a hairy day with the wife taking care of the kids and say, is dinner ready yet? War starts almost on a dime. It just goes fast. So, so there's this battle, and, and, and the war and the darkness are connected, and that's what we have been confessing week after week. I mean, is there any part, what, what part could we say for ourselves? At least we've got that covered. When we have sinned against God in, let me see, Thought, word, and deed. I mean, is there any part of our life that isn't covered with that? Um, we, we know what his will is. Uh, basically, love him and love everybody else. And the, I really, uh, only two problems. <laughs> I don't love him with my whole heart, nor you the way I love myself. And that affects our relationship with each other. And, of course, even worse, affects our relationship with God. That's what the darkness does when there is an absence of Christ. 
And so we, we read it, and sometimes it's very clear. It jumps out at you. Like uh, Herod. What was his full name? Herod the, the Great. Herod the Great. He was great. Yeah, he was great. He had a lot of wives. They don't even know some of the names of uh, some of them. Uh, but one from the Hasmonean line, uh, he killed her. And the two sons, his own, out of threat for his kingdom. So you can imagine when these wise guys come and say to him, well, where's the king? Another king? You're not suggesting there's another king? Oh, yes, this king has a star in the sky, was never there before, it's there. And uh, yeah, do me a favor, will you? You know, on your way out, when you found him, let me know, because I'd really like to meet that guy. I'd like to worship that guy as well. Now, we would wonder whether the Christians kind of, you know, embellish the story. I mean, could really somebody do this? Could they really send soldiers to kill children two years old and younger? I mean, really? I mean, could somebody be so bold some, uh, to just do that and try to rule the people? Could there be that much darkness? Would it be allowed? Could, could, would, the, would the soldiers obey? Yes, with this guy, yes. The darkness has moved into him. And there's always this battle between darkness and light. Uh, you know, I don't have a lot of time here, but I, I just wanted to read, uh, just to finish off some of the thought about darkness, some of the comments that Paul has made about darkness. Uh, in Romans, uh, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, uh, but they became futile in their speculations. Our thoughts are becoming futile, and their foolish heart was darkened. Suggesting that if we've got challenges going on, wherever it is, a job, a family, spouse, um, you know, meaning of life, if we're struggling with that, if that's becoming the darkness, we ought to know what's missing. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, but if your eye is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. What do you see? What are you looking for? Where is the light? Try to see in complete darkness. Anybody else got damage to their toes, uh, shins, knees, uh, wandering around at night? Or have you finally uh, put some nightlight on, as I have? Um, this, John, uh, in, in John's chapter 3, this is the judgment. That the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness more than light. For their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light. Does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. So there's an ongoing battle between light and darkness. And Paul, I, I tried to think of an image. He's in jail uh, when he's writing the letter for today. Uh, but he was also in jail um, as he's at Philippi. He gets thrown in jail. And it's because there's this battle it's because there's a battle of light and darkness. So St. Paul is wandering the streets doing his evangelism, and this divining slave, young lady, keeps coming up and yelling about him. And finally Paul gets ticked, and he turns around and says, all right, that's it, out. And he casts out the demon. Now that's a sign of light, right? I mean, if, if you could take some of the mental problems we have and just cast them out with a word, I, I mean, other than George not having uh, occupation because he's a psychologist, uh, you know, uh, it'd be trouble. It would be, what a gift. So there's the light shining, except for the two owners of the divining girl who now have no income. So they go to the magistrates and they throw him into jail and they rip off their clothes and they beat the heck out of Paul. Uh, and uh, that looks like the darkness. And so Paul's there in jail at night, and the, the jailer has got to keep track of these guys, uh, and uh, they're there. And at midnight, what are they doing? You remember? Light shining in the middle of the darkness. They're singing hymns. And all the prisoners are listening. And they're having a grand old time. They're singing praise to God, having been arrested and beaten and thrown into jail, not, not in good conditions. But St. Paul knows the light. He sees the light in a completely darkened room. They give no night light when they throw you in jail there. Well, then there's an earthquake, and, and the door breaks open, and the jailer thinks, oh, my gosh, I've just lost all the prisoners. And he takes his sword, and he's about to kill himself, and Paul says, wait a minute, we're all here. We didn't go anywhere. He didn't think that, that door was keeping us out uh, in here. 
And the uh, jailer comes in and falls at Paul's knees and asks the question, what must I do to be saved? The light is shining in the darkness. And he brings Paul and his compatriot out, and they go to his house, and he is baptized and his whole household. It's always a battle of light and darkness. And so in Epiphany season, we're going to be hearing how Jesus is revealed as the one who is the light. So the lessons for today, keep saying that, what, what is that? Lift up your eyes, look and see the light. Now, depending on where you're sitting on a particular day, we have uh, a pew, empty pew with the sunlight coming right from there. And I don't know if you've been looking at that. It's been there the whole time. But, of course, you know, the action is here. But if you would pause for a second and look up there, what do you see in the top left quadrant uh, of that uh, circle? What's the, what is that? It's a what? Top, top. I was, I was thinking of the other left. <laughs> Top left, a seashell. Well, that's a Florida reference because, no, no, maybe not. What might that be that reveals the light? What is it? It's the baptismal shell. We actually have one. I don't use it because it's never where, you know. Where. But anyway, it's a baptismal shell. And the baptism shines the light. You understand, Christ says not only I am the light of the world, but y'all are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. How is that possible? I mean, after our confession today, after we know the truth about ourselves, how in the world could we be the light? Because we were baptized into Christ Jesus, into the light. As we have our life, this new life, uh, it is life in Christ. He lives in us, and we live in him. And so the light of Christ can shine from us because of baptism. Top right. Parakeet. I'm sorry, what is that? Dove, my goodness. That would be the Holy Spirit. This is not hard. This is, you're really hesitant. I have no trick questions here. Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Remember what he said to his disciples? I've talked to you all I can talk. There's only one more thing. You're missing the power. You haven't plugged in the wire. That great, powerful computer's not doing anything until it gets the power. You are not going to be my witnesses until power from on high comes upon you. And it was on Pentecost when those disciples are glowing like light bulbs. It's like a, a fire on top of their head. And they go out and become the witnesses. And 3,000 people are baptized at one day. One sermon. The explosion of the faith. The spreading flame, as one history of the Christian church puts it. Bottom left. Yes, you see, it's a book. It is simply a book. Uh, in Greek, let me tell you what the, the, you know, anybody know, I'll give you 53 points other than Carl and, and Pastor. Uh, I'm, I'm a deleting, uh, come on. Uh, the Greek word for Bible, or for book, the Greek word for book. Biblios, thank you, Kay. These, all these Sunday school teachers around, uh, they're really smart people. Biblios, the word itself means book. That's back in the day when there were few books. But that book held the light of the word. It is the revelation of Christ, the revelation of God and of his will, his righteousness. You know, it's like the Harry Potter stuff where they open up the secret book and the light comes out. We need to understand that word in all of its power is light to our feet, to a, a, a way, a light and a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. That's what that word is. So, uh, when we're in darkness, when it doesn't quite make sense, when we're confused about it, when we're struggling, we got to go to the word. And then, of course, the bottom right, chalice and the host, the host in front of the cross there. So, there, there's the celebrant's host when we break the bread at, at the meal and, and the cup. And there it is, the means of Christ. Do this in remembrance of me. You're going to forget all the rest of the theology, but do not forget this. Do this in remembrance of me. This is my body for you. This is my blood for you. Do it again and again and again. And for 2,000 years, the people of God have gathered around this bread and wine 
to receive the means of grace, forgiven and then empowered to forgive. And of course, then the great symbol of the cross, which we're looking through, but, but it is the salvation of the world. This light brings salvation. So I was talking with somebody just this last week, somebody who's close to dying, and, and they've been a good person their whole life doing struggle, and, and right in the middle of the conversation, they said, I just, I just, you know, I'm struggling with this. I, I wanted to do much more in my family and stuff, and so I'm practicing to be a pastor. So the next is, if you want me to say this to you at, at that point, I'd be glad to, but it occurred to me afterwards, maybe she might have took it the wrong way. Uh, anyway, so I'm saying, no, 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 you've, you've done lots. You're good to go. I said, not that way. I mean, I mean, you know, uh, you, you got it. It's okay. It's okay. I'm trying to give peace. And I'm, geez, okay. And so, you know, well, she says, I don't know if I've done enough. And I said, I do. I know you haven't. <laughs> you know. Well, I did, which is true. I said, it's not about what we did. It never was. I haven't done enough. You haven't done enough. We can't earn it. I mean, who's the first per I asked her. I'm doing a Bible study with nine women. Who's, who was the first one to hear the good news that they were going to be with Christ in paradise? Now tell me what he got to do in his life to earn it. He simply believed the one dying on the cross was going to be in paradise and he could bring him. That's the grace of God that comes to us in Jesus Christ. That's why when all is said and done, it's this one who is the light of the world, who brings that light into our hearts and brings us to eternal realms. By no other name can we be saved but that name, Jesus. And so for the epiphany season, we'll be listening and watching the miracles and how people came to understand that that one, that little Jewish guy, that rabbi, that one is the savior of the world and the light of the world. I pray that discovery and then our bearing that into the world in Jesus' name. Amen. We take a few moments to meditate on the word and the will of God.